You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Presented by Hubble 3D. Experience the adventure of spaceflight and the wonders of our universe in IMAX 3D. Hello and welcome. President Obama will finally say something about his plan for NASA. But there's still mixed messages coming out of the space agency as the space shuttle program winds down and new commercial players try to spin up. While SpaceX is savoring what appears to be a successful engine test of its Falcon 9 rocket, we're told by the man in charge of the shuttle program that the fleet doesn't have to stop flying after four more flights. It's just a matter of money. More on all this in a bit. But first, I have to tell you about a Warner Brothers IMAX 3D movie that captures some of the space shuttle's greatest moments and gives those of us who have never been to space an idea of what it is really like to be there. I'm talking about the IMAX Hubble 3D movie, which premiered this week at the Air and Space Museum in Washington. The movie focuses on the last Hubble repair mission in May. NASA bolted a 3D IMAX camera to the payload bay of Atlantis. It captured the astronauts at work in vivid, big screen, in your face detail. He and John are replacing a fine guidance sensor. When it's locked on a target, it would be like holding a... That's Leonardo DiCaprio who narrated the film. Hubble 3D also includes scenes from the first Hubble repair mission and the deployment of the telescope as well. But this time there is something different. IMAX took some of the most iconic images captured by Hubble over the years to the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. There, the filmmakers and the computer whizzes made those images 3D. So in this movie, not only do you feel as if you're flying on board the shuttle, you also are treated to an amazing 3D odyssey through distant galaxies and nebulas. It's an amazing ride. They rolled out the red carpet at the Air and Space Museum for the premiere. The space glitterati, such as it is, was there in large numbers to see the Hubble 3D. Now, Leonardo sent his regrets from a movie set in Japan, and the real star of the show, Hubble, was unable to be there as well. So that meant the big stars of the evening were the crew members of STS-125, decked out in their blue flight suits, ready for their close-ups. The crew, of course, felt a ton of pressure to fix and improve Hubble for the last time. So you would think shooting the movie would be no problem at all. But get this, they only had eight minutes worth of film in that 3D camera in the payload bay, and they were told only to shoot 30 seconds at a time. So they had to be extremely careful about when to say action. But they had trained long and hard, and it all paid off. I spoke to these John Glenn, Steven Spielberg hybrids as they walked down the carpet. We're with Greg Johnson, uh, who is, you really are the guy who actually pushed the button, made this thing work. Uh, what, that's a little bit of pressure. You had eight minutes of film, and you had to do it just right. What's, what's more important, that or deploying the landing gear and the drag chute? <laughs> well, uh, deploying the landing gear and the drag chute were, as I was reminded by many people, is my uh, number one job. But uh, I, I tell people I'd rather been in a thousand knots of closure on a head-to-head -head dogfight than push that button at times. So it was, it was quite a bit of pressure. And, and what made it challenging was the, the, the scenes would not occur um, necessarily as fast as you thought, and you only had about 30 seconds a shot, or maybe at the time you thought they would occur. So in one scene, the, the door actually popped open. We were trying to shoot the door opening. It popped open. That was the end of that scene, and so we had to flex to it. Um, so it was uh, it was quite a bit of pressure, and uh, and it was constantly throughout the day. And each night, Tony would send me a new email to say, you know, what the the, the reshoot scenes were, and and so. Uh, no. It was a lot of pressure, but it was a lot of fun, too. I, I think that's the fun of being an astronaut, is learning something new. It's 30-second chunks. You want to tell the story. You've only got so many opportunities, and you can have everything set up. You look at the lighting. you got to set the uh, focus distance, the aperture, and then you pick the moment to run it. So you hope something exciting is happening. And then you go around, and the sun goes down, and your shot's all wrong now, and you got to wait and set up a whole other uh, event. So it's a challenge, because we didn't want to uh, slow anything down waiting for the right shot we had to shoot around getting the job done but uh, it's great that we're able to tell the story hard as it was there's quite a payoff it's a beautiful movie and it really takes you there of course I haven't been there so I don't know for sure so I asked the crew what they think what's the difference between being there and seeing it in IMAX 3d 
The view of the Earth that you'll see in the background, I've seen some of those clips, and it is just magnificent. You can see the planet as a big giant ball when you spacewalk, and you see, that's kind of what you see in the movie as well. Not quite as, as good, but it's enough to bring back the, the memories and the emotion, not just the like, oh yeah, I saw that, but the emotion of what I felt when I was seeing it. The lighting, for example, of the way the sun hits the telescope with the Earth in the background is very unique. And you know, you try to remember that as best you can. You try to take pictures of it, but you can't get it exactly right. You know, your memory's not perfect, and pictures aren't perfect. This IMAX is as close as we can get to having a perfect memory, is is the way I see it. So I just love the clips I've seen, and I can't wait to see the whole thing put together. Yeah. So it, it really takes you back emotionally it as does. much as anything. Yeah, man. I tell you, I may I may be crying in there. You've had a chance to reflect on the mission and all your impact on Hubble over the years, as the most seasoned of Hubble uh, repair people. What are your thoughts on it? How do you put it all in perspective for yourself? It's, it's kind of it's kind of um, um, awe-inspiring, isn't it? Do all kinds of great things with it. In my new role at the Space Telescope Science Institute, I'm working with Hubble every day. And every day, I'm more and more amazed at this incredible telescope. The things that we're learning, the observations that it's making, and its potential for new discoveries uh, is just fantastic. It's, it, it's almost as if we still haven't really tapped Hubble's potential. What's it like working there and knowing you're up there fixing it? We do that, but it's hard for that to represent what there, are, there are times working at the Institute where I think, you know, I'd like to go back. There's a few other things we could do. Uh, and and hopefully someone will get a chance someday. You never know. Thanks a lot, John Grunsfeld. We'll see you, pal. Of course, IMAX has a long history of making big screen space films. Matter of fact, this is the seventh big picture from their space team. They are led by producer and director Tony Myers. I spoke with her about the challenges of making a movie where the director cannot actually be on location and yet has to get the most important shots recorded on one eight-minute film magazine. Tony, good to have you with us in This Week in Space. Exciting night. Uh, I still am trying to figure out what it's like to have only eight minutes to work with as a director. What was that like for you? Well, I'm used to it. It puts a lot of pressure on the astronaut cinematographer. That goes without saying. And Ray J, who was the pilot, who was the principal IMAX person on STS-125, he did a great great job. What we do is we, we develop during training a, um, a shopping list of scenes that we do by ob observing all the spacewalks in the NBL and picking out the things that are most interesting and different lenses and stuff and um, so we do that and of course it all falls apart when the timeline changes when day becomes night and night becomes day but we train for that too. So, so you, you always have to have plan B if, if, oh, assuming. Absolutely. absolutely. If your ideal shot happens in a nighttime pattern you don't want it. Absolutely, we can't shoot it. We can't expose. So, so th there really aren't any directing challenges quite like this, are there? It is quite unique, but then they are so amazing. I mean, I have no difficulty at all trusting them to do the right thing. They always do. Otherwise, we wouldn't have films to keep bringing people. So, what, what would you, were you um, tense during the mission, wondering how things were? I mean, it must be unbelievable. In a word, yes, I was very tense during the mission because we can't really see what they're shooting. And we know, we know they can write into the laptop what they've shot and how much footage and we can see when the camera runs but we don't actually see the images and then in this particular case you know the, the, the landing was delayed so it didn't come back to the Cape it finally went to California we can't get the camera out of the shuttle in California so it was six weeks before we even got the film to take to the lab and that was big 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 sweat excruciating and then they, I mean then you find out they have the lens cap on or something, you know, or whatever. You there, know. there is that. Yeah, absolutely. You've done how many of these now? Uh, this, well, this is our, was our 24th flight in 25 years, and it's our seventh space-related film. And seventh, seventh time you've directed a space-related one? Well, no, in the early days it was Graham Ferguson, who was the co-inventor of IMAX and our founding father and emeritus. He's the executive producer on this film. He's been my mentor since 40 years back and uh, he was the director on the early films I was the writer and editor of all of them so um, you, you've, you've had a vicarious kind of front seat 
to being in space. I bet you wish you were there, though. I sure do. I'd go in a heartbeat. Absolutely. I've had dreams about being late for my launch and everything. Two <laughs> astronauts dressing. So what's next for you? I don't know. Um, I'm actually working on a couple of projects, but you know, nothing is absolutely firm yet. I'm just going to relax a little bit. Something where you can shoot more than eight minutes, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Tony, thanks very much. The IMAX 3D experience is designed to take you to another place like no other medium can. It is the perfect way to share the experience of space flight and give NASA credit for making all of this happen. The cameras take up a lot of space, weight, and crew training time. And let's remember, back in the Apollo days, NASA engineers argued against taking TV cameras to the moon because there was no mission requirement to do so, and the cameras would add too much weight. Well, we've come a long way, baby, as they say. I asked NASA's Deputy Administrator Lori Garver, who once tried to go to space herself, what she thinks about this way of engaging the public. It is absolutely worth the money to uh, communicate with the public in this way. As technology catches up, I know they're talking about cameras that won't be the size of uh, many refrigerators as these were as we go further, farther, uh, faster, but we definitely will always want to be sharing that experience with the public uh, as technology allows. And this technology is unique. You're going to feel like you are touching the uh, astronauts. Coming up, we'll talk with Hubble's uncle, the astronomer and NASA manager Ed Weiler, who's been there for all the ups and downs of the amazing time machine we call Hubble. We'll ask him what his favorite Hubble images are. An IMAX and shuttle, a match made in history. We'll take a look back. Stay with us. You're watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Presented by Hubble 3D. Experience the adventure of spaceflight and the wonders of our universe in IMAX 3D. This was the scene in Florida the other day. The nine Merlin 1C engines on the Falcon 9 rocket roared to life for three and a half seconds in an apparently successful hot fire test. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk says they will spend the next few weeks doing some in-depth analysis of the data to make sure all went well. This is the last big milestone for SpaceX before the maiden test voyage of Falcon 9. It was the second time they tried. First go round, the test was aborted at T minus two seconds when a valve that was supposed to release helium to start the engine turbo pumps did not open as planned. Turned out it was a software glitch. All eyes are on SpaceX as it races competitor Orbital Sciences to be the first commercial company to start hauling cargo and one day people back and forth to the International Space Station under contract with NASA. Of course, not everyone is ready to go all in on the plan to turn access to space over to the private sector. In the House, Florida lawmakers Suzanne Cosmas and Bill Posey introduced a bill that would earmark money to fly the shuttles past the current retirement date. Kay Bailey Hutchison has introduced a similar bill on the Senate side. And now the shuttle program manager says there's no reason the shuttle can't keep on flying. John Shannon telling reporters at a briefing, it is a myth that NASA would have trouble getting shuttle vendors to restart production. But what about recertification of the orbiters, a requirement that came out of the Columbia accident? Well, he says the agency has done enough of that to fly safely. The tall pole in the tent, as they say at NASA, would be the external tank production. Even if the folks at Lockheed Martin got the word today to start making tanks again, there would still be a two-year gap in any future shuttle flights. But the bottom line, says Shannon, is the bottom line. Um, I think the, the real issue that the agency and, and the nation has to address is the expense. Um, the shuttle program is, uh, is fairly expensive. We, we burn at about a $200 million a month rate. And uh, so that uh, gives you a base of about uh, $2.4 billion per year uh, that it would require to continue flying the shuttle, uh, almost irregardless of how many flights you flew during the year. I'm flying five flights this year at about that much money. Um, if I flew two flights, it might be a little bit less, but not a, not a significant amount less. There's just a, a base cost there that you, you have to pay to keep the program in business. And uh, where that money comes from is, is the big question. 
That money is not in the Obama administration's 2011 NASA budget, nor are there dollars for the Constellation project to return astronauts to the moon. It's a big change, and up to now, we've not heard the president say a peep about it. That is about to change. The White House announcing Obama will be in Florida on April 15th to host a conference on the future of America's space program. Details are still TBA, but you can bet the president will offer a spirited defense of his plan to promote commercial transportation services to low Earth orbit and reorient NASA's efforts toward developing new technologies for exploration beyond LEO. You can also bet he's going to get an earful from a lot of angry folks on the Space Coast who are headed for the unemployment line right now. IMAX and NASA have had a good marriage over the years, and it all began at the site of the premiere, the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum. When it opened in 1976, IMAX was a brand new idea. The first movie to play there was to fly. The museum director at the time was Apollo 11 command module pilot Mike Collins, who immediately thought IMAX needed to go to space. The first product of that idea was Hail Columbia in 1982, and the IMAX space hits have just kept on coming. Twist correspondent David Waters takes a look back. Talk about the IMAX camera's history in the space program. Is, is this something that was you know, designed with the space program in mind, or how did that happen? Uh, early on, as a matter of fact, in this theater, uh, Michael Collins, who was the director when this theater opened years ago, said, we need to fly shuttle, now you need to fly uh, IMAX on the space shuttle. And the IMAX folks, Graham Ferguson, who is the founder, uh, didn't know what the shuttle was. You know, Graham? What, what do you think of that? <laughs> good, good. No, Mike said to me, um, when he first saw IMAX in his own movie theater here in the Air and Space Museum, he said, we, the IMAX camera has to go into space because it's the only way the world will experience what I, as an astronaut, have experienced. And he'd gone to the moon. And so that was essentially what you're, we're seeing tonight is exactly what he had in mind. When you heard it the first time, though, and he said, let's fly, did you think the guy was crazy for flying, wanting to fly this huge camera? No, I didn't think he was crazy at all. I thought he was very smart. <laughs> <laughs> of course you say that. Well answered. Well played. Are you guys looking forward to this premiere and seeing all the reactions of everybody? Very very much so. I, I just saw my first viewing of the, of the film last night. Uh, so as director of photography, I never kind of know what it's going to look like until it gets up there. So, uh, uh, yeah, very excited. And I think people will be really pleased to, to see the the work of this astronaut crew fixing Hubble up to, to be better than new and uh, see some great image from space that it's uh, captured. You're the expert on this. How did they do as photographers? They did really good. Uh, we had eight minutes of film. I think we probably used seven minutes and 59.9 seconds of it. So it's, uh, they did good a ratio there. pretty good. They have a really great, I wish I had that good of a shooting ratio. They'd probably hire me more if they did. <laughs> You've been doing a lot of IMAX films in the past, but this is not the first space one. No, this is our seventh space movie with this group, with the space team, the IMAX space team led by Tony Myers that was founded by Graham Ferguson, who's one of the co-founders of IMAX. And we've, we've been doing these films for 20 odd years. And it's really, um, this is our pride and joy. IMAX has now migrated into, a, we have a, a big Hollywood business with Avatar and Alice in Wonderland. But these are the movies that we actually get to make. And these are the movies that, that are sort of inside us in a, in a way that, why we got into the IMAX business. And as much as we love the Hollywood stuff, it's really fun to, to put on your filmmaking hat and your production executive hat and, and, and show the world what space exploration is all about. And, and this is, we have a, a history and lineage with space films, and we take it very seriously. Thank you very much, David Waters. The Hubble Space Telescope is, of course, an amazing instrument. In order to focus on a distant target, this scope, the size of a school bus, does not deviate more than seven one thousandth of an arc second. That's the same as trying to hold a laser pointer steady on a dime that is 400 miles away. Hubble beams down about 120 gigabytes of data each week. The telescope is named for astronomer Edwin Hubble, who confirmed the expansion of the universe, which led to the Big Bang Theory. The idea for a space telescope was conceived by the late Princeton astronomer Lyman Spitzer. Another NASA telescope is named after him. Uh, now, if Hubble is the ancestor and Spitzer is the father, Ed Weiler might be called Hubble's uncle. The NASA astronomer and manager has been with the Hubble program since the blurry-eyed beginning. 
with, with Hubble's uncle, uh, it, it, kind of wacky uncle, but it's all right. No, let's um, let's talk about Hubble right now. And okay. you, you know, we talk about this frequently. And I know you go and talk to kids a lot. Mm -hmm. What do you tell them about Hubble? Uh, all kinds of things. It's a time machine. Just we can talk. Kids are really fascinated by the fact that uh, it takes time for light to get from one place to another, and they can't understand. It's hard for them to grasp the fact that everything we look at in the universe is older than we are. I'm, I'm sorry, younger than we are. I would get confused. Uh, so that if you're looking at an object one billion uh, light years away, that object's light left a billion years ago. So it may not even be there now. So, and the further you look back in, uh, back in space, the further you look back in time. So Hubble's like a time machine to them, and they really get fascinated by that. You know, plus, it, plus, they love black holes and you know that kind of stuff. To, to be a part of this program as you have been, we've talked about the roller coaster ride that is Hubble. Uh, do you consider yourself pretty fortunate? I was just talking to my wife about that tonight, about being at the right place at the right time. When I was getting my PhD at Northwestern, my, my thesis advisor just happened to have worked at Princeton, had been on the staff at Princeton, knew a professor at Princeton, lined me up with an interview, and I got a job at Princeton right out of graduate school, working for Lyman Spitzer, who turned out to be the father of the Hubble Space Telescope. And Princeton had a job for me part-time at Goddard Space Flight Center operating a Princeton satellite, so I wound up getting connected to Goddard, which got me connected to NASA headquarters, and eventually I joined NASA as the chief scientist for Hubble. And it's just amazing coincidences, and then I spent 30 years of my life on Hubble. So, and what a ride, what a ride it is. And, and you know, the beauty of it is it's not even close to being over, is it? Uh, it's been 20, it'll be 20 years on April 24th, I remember that date, uh, and there's no reason why we can't can't go another five, six, even ten years because we've got six new gyros, new instruments. Uh, there's not much that uh, will shoot us down. What's, what, it's impossible to predict, I know, but what are you interested in? What questions are, are you most interested in now with the refurbished Hubble? I think Hubble's going to be pushed even further back. It, it can never get back to the very beginning when stars and galaxies just turned on in the universe, but it's going to get a little closer uh, with the new instruments. It's, it's gotten about seven or eight hundred million years after the Big Bang. I think we're going to push back to maybe 500 or even 400. So it's going to give us a good taste of what the, the James Webb Space Telescope is really going to clean up on, and that is how did the universe start producing matter and stars and galaxies. We're getting pretty far back in time now. Doesn't get much than that. Well, yeah, but there was a lot of action before 500 million years. That's the interesting thing. What do, hey, I, I'm sure you get asked this quite a bit. Do you have a favorite image? Eagle Nebula, the pillars of creation, uh, I, and the Hubble Deep Field. I have, to, I have to have two. I mean, for the beauty of it, the Eagle Nebula, for the science, the pure scientific breakthroughs, that one, uh, the first Hubble Deep Field was just uh, incredible. That, that one image rewrote textbooks. When I, the textbooks I read in graduate school about when the galaxy started forming and all that were proven wrong by that one image. All these years, you've watched the repairs. Have you wanted to be there? Could you ask that question again? All these years, watching the Hubble repair missions, have you wanted to be up there doing what the astronauts do? When I was in graduate school, I applied for the first class of science astronauts. And there were about 5,000 applicants. I made it to the final 500 or something, but didn't make it. And I stopped trying because I have glasses and all that. But yes, I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a grad student. Uh, so I live vic vicariously through John Grunsfeld and people like that. <laughs> and through IMAX. And through IMAX, yeah. Have you seen, you've seen IMAX 3D before, yet you haven't seen this movie yet. I've seen previews of this movie. Tell me what you think. It was, uh, it was like being there. I mean, it's really like being there. So uh, I'm a believer after watching that and then watching Avatar, I'm looking forward to tonight. I never thought I'd like 3D because the stuff we had when we were kids was garbage compared to what we got now. <laughs> Ed Weiler, thanks. Wow, you guys look like you're right there. The IMAX Hubble 3D movie opens worldwide at IMAX theaters on March 19th. It is mandatory viewing for all Twist watchers. There will be a quiz. Time for us to go. Before we leave, let's check the mailbag. This one from Richard Steele caught our eye. He liked our interview with Buzz Aldrin last week. He said, I was happy to hear Buzz talking about new systems, especially a new heavy launch vehicle, writes Richard. But it was kind of funny when Buzz started talking about the need to invent a new HLV when a model of the best one ever invented was visible just over his shoulder. 
shoulder, referring to the Saturn V. It would seem that all of the effort towards a new HLV is just reinventing the wheel. What's wrong with the Saturn V version 2.0? And this comment came from our YouTube show page. Only this show can tell me what's up in space. No news cable show or network news has ever done a better job. So much scope on this subject. Thank you. And this tweet from Pillownot. Oh, wow, you do look like Pierce Brosnan. Awesome. Well, awesome indeed. Thank you, Pillow Knot. Send us your thoughts to twist at spaceflightnow.com. Visit us at spaceflightnow.com forward slash twist. Check out the blog, milesobrien.com. Next week, a wise report to share with you. The WISE telescope has been in space for two months and already spotted a dozen dark, stealthy asteroids that are near Earth, and we didn't know they were there. Don't worry, the sky is not falling yet. We'll see you then, we hope.